Hi, welcome to Humpback Chronicles. Uh, one of the first stories I, I told was about Frank, the first singer I worked with, and uh, the first researcher I worked with, and probably the person that changed my life into getting involved with whale research was Dr. Jim Darling. Uh, at the time, that time, he was a graduate student working with us on a film, but uh, Jim's guidance, his introductions to research and to people I needed to work with have been uh, a, a key factor in, in my success working with whales. And I'm really happy this week to have Jim talk about some of the things we're doing with song and uh, especially song playback, experiments with whales and listening to their own song. I was not a fan of playbacks for a bunch of reasons. Uh, based, I think, mostly on my experience assisting on early playbacks in the 80s. And the problem is is control, especially in a place like Maui, where whales are interacting everywhere. Uh, you, you really have no idea if a whale is responding to a playback or something else is going on, which is, is not a small issue. Um, but then on top of that, uh, you know, after spending years you know, trying not to disturb whales and studying natural behavior patterns. It was sort of a, a fairly big change of gears here where we are setting out to disturb them and actually trying to trick them, you know, into responding. And then on top of that, I, I you know, I, I didn't really believe it would work anyway. I mean, we have this tiny little 18-inch speaker which is dropped into an ocean full of natural sound. And, you know, you know whales are just going to say, you know, you got to be kidding and you know, carry on with whatever they were doing. We were at a point in our studies on song function where we had been for several years studying the interactions of neighboring singers. I mean, one boat was on one singer and the second on the nearest neighbor, and we were making simultaneous recordings uh, really to, to, to try to gain any insight at all into acoustic interactions. Uh, I, can't say, I can't say as we had enormous success on that, but what we did find was a variety of physical interactions. In some cases, one neighbor stopped and joined the other. Other times, one neighbor stopped singing and moved towards the other, but just passed right by him, didn't join. And at other times, the neighbors seemed to ignore each other entirely. So the question was, even though the songs sounded the same to us, you know, with, with all whales singing essentially the same version uh, at any one time, you know, was there a difference in song which led to these different interactions? So, you know, semi-reluctantly, um, I guess and the fact that a funder let me know they'd be more interested in funding playbacks than the proposal which I had written, uh, we got into playbacks. Now, the idea was we would take the place of the neighboring singer with an underwater speaker, and we'd have control over, you know, which song was broadcast. So we'd play back essentially whatever we wanted to and measure the response of the uh, neighboring singer. I, I did not think this would work, but we set out with a plan. Um, first of all, we did it in late season when there was a far lower density of whales um, in Maui than there is during the peak. And so we had some hope of control. We also uh, used two boats, one stationed with a subject, also known as a victim whale, and the other boat was, you know, anywhere from six to 800 meters away. That's like eight football fields distance with the playback speaker. Now, we chose this distance because this was often what, you know, the, the distance between neighboring singers from the earlier studies. We also had a speaker which was tested to produce the same level of sound as a whale, and the plan was, you know, to change the song and document the reply or, you know, basically turn it on and see what happened. So the very first day, it was dead calm. It was April 9th, 2005. And it's always amazing to me what you can do on calm days. But we found a singer, no other whales around, recorded a full song, identified it so as we knew who it was. And then one boat led by Megan with uh, videographer Jason Sturgis stayed with that singer uh, watching it closely, it was they were able to actually see it from the boat underwater um, as they were just motionless there. And the other boat moved off 800 meters, lowered the speaker. And in this case, we played back the whale's own song that we just recorded. Uh, the reason for that was, you know, it was just no question that it was a similar song. 
Now, we have a video here which uh, shows all this, but I need to explain what you're going to see. Um, first is the singer, you know, our subject. Uh, Jason was uh, under strict instructions to stay a long way away from it so as not to be a factor in whatever happened. So you see the whale singing, you know, you're looking down on it from the surface. And then a hand will come across the lens, um, and this indicates when the playback started. In other words, uh, I, I would radio Megan, she hollered at Jason, and he would move his hand so as we knew exactly when the playback started. Then you see, um, you know, the whale's reaction. And this was within seconds. The song got a little bit louder, and the whale just vanished for what seemed like a a very long time. I mean, I think it was about eight minutes or something like that, but uh, the ocean was dead calm. Um, everything was quiet. We had two boats scanning the horizon for any kind of whale at all. Um, and the conditions were such that we would have seen or at least heard them. And after a while, I figured, you know, geez, I mean, all we'd done is sort of scare this whale away. I mean, it just, you know, and so much for playbacks. Uh, you know, time to sort of pack up and go on to the next challenge. But then a few minutes later, you know, we had actually left the playback speaker song running. And you know how, you know, when you're in a boat, you're sort of generally looking out at the horizon for whales, um, you know, looking in all directions. Uh, someone in the boat, uh, I'm not sure, I can't remember who, just sort of happened to glance down and Lo and behold, our whale was right below the boat with its nose in the playback speaker. And this went on, I mean, his, his attention to the speaker went on for quite a while. I mean, it was enough time, you know, for Megan to bring the other boat over and for Jason to slip in the water and film the whale circling and approaching the speaker. So, so as you, you know, look at the video, the only, um, it goes dark for a second, which is where, you know, we move from uh, seeing the initial um, singing whale to where we started filming um, the whale around the speaker. Now this was nothing less than stunning for me anyway. I mean, uh, this whale was not only listening to everything in the ocean, and there were lots of black on, you know, background singers, um, but it knew within seconds when an additional sound was sort of added. And um, then a few minutes later, actually located the source of that sound at 800 meters, um, you know, we never saw the whale. It never surfaced or anything. It just apparently swam more or less directly to this, uh, to, to the playback speaker. Now, you know, if we did nothing else on playbacks, it was a revelation of the capabilities of these whales. Um, I mean, we talk about it all the time, how important sound is, but uh, you really don't get it until you see something like this. Now, this led to <laughs> two years of playbacks uh, that we kept relatively simple. In other words, we played either the current song or we played a foreign song, which was recorded in Africa. Um, you know, the songs were clearly different in composition, but they were both obviously humpback song. And this is what we found, if you look at this graphic. Uh, the playback speaker is on the far sort of left of the graphic, and then the, the uh, whale as the playback started is in the middle. And if you look at the uh, pink arrows, this is where we played back current song, the whales tended to join the speaker, just like we saw in the video. Uh, if we played foreign song, the whales tended to move away and increase their distance from the speaker. Now, we don't know what the trigger was. Um, it was apparently not composition, which we thought it might be initially, uh, or at least our conception of composition, as the reactions were often in seconds. In other words, they did not listen to the whole composition of the song and then make a decision. Although a few did, um, most did not. Now we, now, we thought this was interesting enough to publish a paper, but basically it just raised a bunch of questions and led to three additional years of of more sophisticated playbacks, uh, a greater variety of stimuli, different songs, uh, including manufactured sort of edited songs, and a lot of control sounds. We we wanted to make sure that the whales were not responding to just some kind of new sound in the, in the ocean instead of 
actually responding to their songs. And we got a lot of complex, I mean, fascinating, but complex data in return, uh, um, almost overwhelmingly so. Uh, the attraction or repulsion seen in the earliest studies occurred, but it, it was clear that was far from the whole story. Now, I've not analyzed these last three years yet. Um, everything's sitting in a, a large box underneath my desk waiting for what's probably going to be about a year of work. But it's coming, and uh, stand by. Uh, I feel very lucky to work with people like Jim Darling, Megan Jones, and the folks we work with, and the people who help us do our work. Uh, I don't think we'll ever run out of fun things to do. Thank you very much. See you next week.